Okay. I have 115. So I suppose we should get started. How's everybody doing today? Good. Great. Um, I wanted you to know that I posted the first of what will probably be two um, lectures <clears throat> related to chapter seven um, in the course shell. That is the chapter on microbial nutrition, ecology, and growth. So I'm pretty sure I got up through, um, let's see, section 7.5. Yeah. And then um, probably Thursday or Friday, I'll finish up the remaining part of that chapter. We are a bit ahead. I am a bit ahead of the schedule on the syllabus because of the exam last week um, uh, that kind of pushed chapter six into this week. So you probably haven't gotten into chapter seven yet. I suspect maybe you have, but um, if you have, um, you can you can access that first few sections of chapter seven. So I wanted to let you know about that. Um, I have the exams corrected. You probably have gone into the grade book and looked at those scores. So um, if you would like to chat one on one about your exams, we can certainly do that. I can I can pull it up. We can take a look at it. Um, I wish there was a way and there probably is. I just don't know how to do it for you to access it yourself. Um, but I think I think what I'm going to do is just um, suggest that if you want to take a look at it, see what what uh, questions you got wrong, that you maybe maybe gonna make an appointment uh, via Starfish during one of my office hours, and then we can we can Zoom, um, or we can sit down in my office um, here on Tuesdays and Wednesdays during certain times too. So whatever, uh, if any of those work, we can do that. So um, we're in the virus chapter, I believe, or you should be in the virus chapter by now, either having completed it or certainly into the first half of it. Um, any, any particular questions related to the virus chapter? We can pull up the PowerPoint. We can, we can access those slides. In fact, well, while you're thinking about that, I will go into Blackboard and um, pull it up. Do you know what sections um, are going to be on the quiz on Thursday? Um, we don't have a quiz scheduled for this Thursday. Oh, OK. Yeah, isn't that nice for a change? Yeah, if you check again the schedule, we had our exam on the 25th, which I think was last Thursday. And then here for week six, we have no quiz scheduled. So, so you're off the hook. How nice is that, huh? Yeah. How about questions on on the virus chapter or or what have you? Are we gonna you know like size differences? I know at the beginning of the chapter it got into like a couple different size differences between the virus and um, well I think it was the different kind of viruses. Okay, ask that one more time. <clears throat> Are we gonna need to know the difference between the um, virus sizes? that it emphasizes at the beginning of the chapter. OK, let's take a look at that section you're talking about. Uh, 
Uh, was that Melissa? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm imagining you're you're referencing <clears throat> this slide. Tell me if I'm wrong. Do you see the slide? No. No. Okay. Let's try this again. Okay. How about that slide? Do you see the slide? Yeah. Was that what you were referring to, Melissa? When um, it, the sizes I, of the viruses? Yeah, I thought I went more into it somewhere, though, like in the book. I'm just trying to find it. Okay, yeah, give me some specifics because I'm not sure where you're talking. If the question is, do I need to know that megavirus is 800 nanometers and rabies virus is 125 nanometers? <clears throat> the answer is absolutely you do. No, you don't. Just kidding. No, you don't have, have to memorize these numbers. <clears throat> Yeah, I think that's I, it. I think it's worthwhile, and this is what I, I hope you took away from the Zoom lecture when you watch this, was the fact that when we compare viruses to bacteria, the bacteria dwarf most of the viruses in terms of size. I mean, the fact that this, this T2 phage here, number eight, which I talked quite a bit about in chapter uh, six, I mean, look at that. I mean, it is tiny compared to E. coli or staph or strep. Um, and so the, the sole purpose of us talking about sizes and so forth of these different cells and viruses is to get you, give you at least an appreciation of how tiny they are. And so it should not surprise us that when we talk about SARS-CoV-19, COVID, yeah, COVID-19, COVID-2, that these little uh, viruses can obviously uh, be carried in the air. They're, they're very easily transmitted um, because they're so small, right? Yeah. Um, so to the extent to which you should have an appreciation of their size, you do not need to, to memorize the, the sizes. No, not at all. Okay. That'd just be crazy for me to expect that. I'm not that crazy. Close to that. Good question. Viruses are really interesting um, entities. I got to be careful what word I use because they're not alive, right? They, they uh, require a cell to parasitize, if you will. And then, as I've said, the cell basically is taken over by the virus. And by that, I mean, what does the virus provide the cell that totally re redoes what that cell ordinarily wouldn't do? What, what does the virus give to the cell? Uh, it's RNA or DNA. Right. It gives it a nucleic acid. One of those two, exactly. And then I liken it to an instruction booklet. You know? Now, all I have in front of me is my, my textbook. But um, in the case of a virus, it's not a huge textbook because viruses only typically carry, um, you know, a handful of genes. So I'm looking for a little notebook. I don't have anything nearby, but imagine a smaller little uh, notebook that is introduced and on, in that notebook is the directions that the cell is going to read. By that I mean, you know, utilize the DNA and or the messenger RNA and end up making more viral protein and more viral nucleic acid, which the cell not only provides those building block structures, but it also packages those viruses inside itself. And then of course it releases them. So viruses are, are acellular, they're, they're not cells. And so when, when I hear about COVID and people talking about the need to kill COVID, let's kill it. And of course, how am I going to react to that? How are you going to react to that when your mom says, we need to do whatever we can do to kill this virus. You're going to- You can't kill it. You can't kill it because it ain't alive. 
So a large part of, of you know, fighting this infection for the last 12 months now is educating the public about so many things and it's virtually impossible to, to do what we're doing in this chapter to 328 million people in this country. But we should be trying to educate people because ignorance is the way to go if you wanna make bad decisions in your life, right? It's really true, whether it's, it's in our lives or in, it's for our country, you know, we, we need to be educated. We have to know the facts and we have to follow what we know, yeah. So, um, so I think more than ever, this chapter should be very interesting. Uh, and, and I hope you find it interesting because it's pertinent to our lives. My gosh, I cannot think of a, a more pertinent topic. Um, and you know, if it wasn't, if our course was not so jam packed with stuff that we have to get through, it would be nice to do, maybe I should just do it anyway, do a lecture um, that talks about the biology of COVID-19. I think it's just really interesting. I, there's a lot I don't know, you know, um, but I know enough that I can share some things. And uh, actually the, the publisher of the book added a, a PowerPoint on COVID-19, which I should just maybe post if anybody's interested in looking at it. Um, I have looked at it. It's pretty cool. It's pretty interesting. It was updated last December, so they're keeping up with the, with the latest. Now, it might not have the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which was just approved yesterday. You probably hear that in the news. Yeah, because um, things are happening quickly. As you, as I think you all well know, the fact that we can take in, in a little over a year uh, and generate you know, now three, if not more virus uh, vaccines is absolutely astonishing to turn it over in that period of time. It normally takes five, 10 years. But anyway, I, I uh, diverge a bit from our topic, but still. Yeah, I just think this chapter in viruses is very, very interesting. Um, have you started to, to look at the, the lecture already? Good. I think all of the videos should be playing properly. I've gone through and checked them all and tried to repair those that were not working. And, and I'll just mention as I, as I think of it, um, I go in to each of these PowerPoints um, and, and look them all over, all of the slides. And if there are links that are no longer viable or if there are videos that I might've posted in a particular format that aren't playing properly, I try to fix those. So if you happened to try to download, let's just say all of the PowerPoints into a, your thumb drive, and then you're just accessing your thumb drive and you did this back in um, you know, late January, it's very possible that some of the PowerPoints that I've posted in the course shell may have some some slight edits or modifications to the to what you know was posted initially. In other words, all of the future chapters are sub subject to editing. I, I always try to update them. I don't let them sit there for years and not touch them. I go over them every single semester and I try to add and tweak and you know what can I do to make this a better PowerPoint slide. I try. I'm not sure that I always succeed, but anyway, anything in the in the in the virus chapter you'd like to review? Things that are confusing to you? Um, Can we go over some of the stuff of the envelope? Sure. Do you want to talk about you know what makes an envelope virus different from a naked virus, or do you want to talk about how the envelope itself is is put on the virus as it emerges from the cell? Or where, where are you, Samantha, with, with your question, I guess? Um, how the envelope happens, um, I'm just more confused because if the envelope comes out of the cell and it takes part of the cell with it to create that envelope, yeah. does that mean the original yeah. virus was a naked virus? Or how does that all work? OK, great question. So what Samantha's asking about, and I'll, I'll just pull up the PowerPoint and we'll go to that slide. Um, 
I'm pretty sure you're talking about uh, page 176, that figure 6.11. At least that's what I was going to have us take a look at. So early parts of the chapter basically distinguish between what are called naked viruses and enveloped viruses. Okay. The major difference is that a naked virus lacks an envelope. That's, that's why it's called naked. Now, it doesn't mean it doesn't have an outer protein coat, if you will. It does. And, and again, I'm deviating a little bit, but Samantha, I'm going to get to where you want to go in just a second. The, the capsid here is made of protein, shown in blue. And the inner core, of course, in, in uh, purple kind of violet, of course, is the DNA or the RNA, depending upon whether it's a DNA virus or an RNA virus. Here, we're looking at that capsid, or a similar capsid, I should say, it's a different virus. But you can see the protein capsid here in kind of a blue aquamarine. Here's our nucleic acid. And then surrounding it is the envelope. And all you gotta do, for example, is to look at COVID-19. And I don't know that I have a quick, easy diagram to pull up here. If I go online, I'm probably find one. But you've seen the diagrams, haven't you, of these spikes that stick out on the surface? of an artist's sketch or animation, yeah. So these particular surface spikes or glycoproteins are often, um, are embedded within a, a bilayer, not unlike a cell membrane is made up of a phospholipid bilayer with embedded proteins, it's very similar. So the spikes here are special glycoproteins, meaning they're part sugar, part protein. And it's the, it's the spikes and there's not, typically just one type, there's numerous spikes. It's the spikes that give the cell or give the virus the specificity in terms of how it combines with receptor sites on the host cell. In other words, if the host cell doesn't have the proper receptor for the spike to fit into, will the virus get in? The answer is no. It's like, I can start my key, I can start my car with my car key because there's a complementary fit of those two. I can't start my car with my apartment key or my house key. I mean, it's a dumb analogy, but you get what I'm saying. They have to complement. One has to accept the other. So it's the same sort of idea here. Um, so I wanted just to briefly point out the difference between naked and enveloped. Okay, so getting then to Samantha's question about how does a virus get an envelope once it gets ready to emerge from the host cell? And so there's a a figure here, which I'm having a hard time finding. And I probably went past it, 611. Here it is. So here we have an enveloped virus, right? Y'all recognize the spikes, they haven't pointed out. Here's our inner capsid and then our innermost nucleic acid. And as we just mentioned a moment ago, we have the receptors on the surface of the whole cell into which the spikes of the virus fit. This is the first of several steps in multiplication of this particular virus. It's called adsorption. And again, I specifically go through this in the Zoom lectures. And I will just say one more time, if you're asked about this on the test and, you're, and you go to explain it, I don't wanna be reading about absorption because there ain't no step called absorption. It's adsorption, A-D, not A-B, A-D, A-D, adsorption. So there's adsorption of the virus, and it's often not just one viral particle. We're just showing one for simplicity's sake, but there can be numerous virus particles simultaneously docking with the whole cell membrane. It's very possible. And then, of course, we see the invagination of the cell membrane forming a vesicle. Now, vesicle, this is basic cell bio. A vesicle is nothing more than a membranous structure within which is some cargo that's being carried. The cargo in this case is the virus. But the vesicle was formed from the cell membrane through this endocytosis process. Endocytosis meaning bringing it in. Exocytosis means getting rid of it. That's going to happen later. So via endocytosis, the cell membrane invaginates, forming a vesicle. 
that vesicle, the outermost part of that structure came from the cell membrane. Then we have to uncoat the virus. And so the vesicle opens up and look what leaves. The, um, the actual envelope here appears to stay connected to the vesicle wall because it looks like just what amounts to the capsid and the nucleic acid is released. And then that in turn is further uncoated, if you will, such that what ultimately gets spilled out into the cytoplasm is the, in this case, uh, RNA. Now, the reason I know it's RNA is because it says that, <laughs> but there's another reason why I know it's RNA. If this was DNA, it would have to go into the nucleus where it would be transcribed. But because it's RNA, it's gonna stay in the cytoplasm and there the cell will make more RNA from that. It'll copy the RNA. It will also then use all this RNA to help make protein through a process called translation. Now, you should have all heard that term before somewhere in your lives, translation. Translation involves the utilization of different types of RNA to help assemble protein. Now, we talk about it in ANP with respect to messenger RNA and ribosomal RNA and transfer RNA. And that's why I continually re reminded you guys that it wouldn't be a bad idea to go back into your ANP one notes if you still haven't burned them and check out chapter four, um, because um, there we, if, if you had me anyway, we talked in some detail about that. Now, if you had me and we talked about it in some detail, I'm sure you probably didn't like me because that stuff is not easy to digest. It's, there's a lot of detail, but I knew that 80 plus percent of you guys that I had in class in AP1, I was gonna see in micro. And I knew we're gonna be talking about this very process. I knew this, I didn't tell you this, but that's why I spent so much time on what was a fairly small section of chapter three in the AMP book. Yeah, that's the reason why I did that. So I, if you have your notes or if you even have your book or if you wanna borrow my book, I, I'll give you what I've got. You're welcome to borrow my AMP books and go back and review that truly. Go back and review transcription and translation. It's gonna make this so much more easy to understand. And we can talk about that if you'd like to do that, certainly. But what the whole cell is doing to get to Samantha's question is it's gonna synthesize new RNA, utilize that to make protein via translation. Now see where it says new capsomers and I apologize for being so small in print, but I think you can read that, right? Yeah, so the capsomers, those are the different parts to the outer protein, we'll call it shell. There it is. And so those are, those are packed together. We also need to introduce what else into the core of that. What's inside this? More RNA. Right, more RNA. So there's our capsid, but we don't see a, a, an envelope yet, do we? And of course, the reason we don't see it is because it's not fully formed yet, but here goes that if you want to think of it as a kind of a kind of a naked quote unquote naked virus, it's not really naked, uh, although is it? Well, it doesn't have an envelope, but it's going to get an envelope, and it has gotten an envelope here as exo exocytosis has occurred, but it gets that outer envelope. Thank you very much, cell membrane of host cell. So the host cell membrane has to introduce those spikes that we know have to be there, right? Because this, this virus that started the whole business off is the same kind as leaves, right? It's the same virus, it, not the same viral particle, but it's the same virus. In this case, rubella virus. So that, that's where 
the, the virus gets its envelopes in it, it gets it from the host cell membrane. And that host cell membrane has to know how to produce those spikes, right? And it does. It, it's given the instruction booklet, that's part of the instruction booklet it gets in order to how to create those spikes that ultimately go into the production of, of the envelope. I got that. I think I might be reading too much into it. I think my question was more, how did the original envelope develop? So you have <laughs> the one with an envelope going into a cell and when it leaves, it comes back out with another envelope. Yeah. But what gave it the envelope in the first place? Well, you know, what is the meaning of life, Samantha? You know, that, that's the question you're asking. It's a wonderful question. In other words, why are there naked viruses? Why are there envelope viruses? You know, that speaks to the evolution of these things. Um, I'm not sure that I can, I can intelligently answer that question. I mean, ultimately you're asking why does it, why does it envelope a particular group of, of viruses have envelopes and others don't? Um, yeah, that's a bigger philosophical evolutionary question. Would it be more of, for, of a survival thing for that virus to have the envelope versus not? Well, like, you know, ultimately it boils down to what are the benefits or disadvantages of, ha of, of, of having wings if you're a bird or fins if you're a fish? I mean, I know that's kind of a silly philosophical question to ask, but just because you don't have an envelope doesn't mean you're necessarily at a disadvantage, okay? You might, you might, and maybe I've led you down the road of thinking of an envelope virus is a better virus to be than a naked virus. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm saying there are these two general categories. Um, one's not better than the other, but it, you'd have to understand, you know, what host cell does the virus make use of? There are, there are just a myriad of questions that you have to ask and learn about as to why certain viruses either have or don't have envelopes. It, 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 it's a broader biological question that I, I just don't have the knowledge to answer. Does that, does that make sense? I have a question. It's a great question to me, but I don't, I'm not saying it's not a great question. It's a wonderful question. I wish I could answer it. Okay, yeah, who was asking that? Me, okay. okay. Yeah. Um, so looking at that, like, um, figure 6.11. Mm -hmm. So the top virus that already like has the envelope, um, does it already have it because it already like was in fact, like, I don't know how to explain it. See at the bottom how it says like step six, it's release. Yeah. And um, the last sentence is um, this complete virus is ready to infect uh, another cell. Is yeah. that where that first one at the top came from? Well, yeah. this this could have come from me sneezing and you inhaling the virus that I have. Yeah. Or it's possible that this virus came from another cell mm -hmm. and it's going on to infect another of the same kind of cell. Okay. Yeah. And, and that's, again, a great question. Um, so ordinarily, you know, when we get a viral infection, let's just say flu. That's a good example. We all know what flu is. Flu is due to a, a virus. How do we get flu? Well, we can get it via the respiratory system. That's often a, a portal of entry, right? A lot of flu viruses are airborne. Uh, uh -oh. And so that's how that virus gets into you and I. There, there are other viruses like the AIDS virus that would require a more um, direct sort of contact. And it could be, you know, via sexual intercourse. It could be through a blood transfusion, right? You're not going to get the AIDS virus typically from, from uh, breathing, breathing the air of somebody who has AIDS sitting in the same room that you are at a, at a meeting or something like that. Because that virus has a totally different uh, biology, if you will, a whole new separate unique way of, of getting into the, the patient, if you will, or the, the individual. Um, but at some point in time, you have to be subjected to the virus. Um, 
skin. So the, 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 the majority of ways that viruses get in would be, again, respiratory or through some direct body bodily fluid contact. Um, digestive system wise, um, I, yeah, I suppose there's some viruses that can get in via the digestive system too. But you've got to be exposed to it at some point. Um, and again, the whole purpose of, of the virus being able to replicate is its need to get into that host cell. And as we've talked about, the host cell does all the work and out, out buds in this case, um, it's not just one viral particle. You know, we're talking thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of virions, same word, same term, virion virus particle. Um, so a cell can shed you know, thousands of viruses. Uh, it, it, just think of how you feel at peak infection when you're in bed, fever, runny nose, vomiting, the whole wonderful experience we've had is, you know, when we get sick. You know, that's just prior to that time was when our cells, our infected, our infected cells were shedding tons of virus and then those viruses were invading other cells. And this was just, this, this battle was just kind of coming to a head, right? Um, but when you're in bed with the flu and fever and all that stuff, um, you can sort of rest assured that within a day or two, you're gonna feel better because the immune system has started to fight that invader by that time. Um, you know, that's one reason you run a fever. It's, in, in, it's the body's way of, of trying to negate the action of, of the bacterium or the virus or whatever the case may be. Um, but does that kind of answer your question? Yeah. Okay, great, great question. Lots in the chat here, I haven't been reading the chat. So, um, Viruses, again, are either DNA or RNA. They're, they don't carry both. Um, are we going to need to know what's specific to those for the test? Do you need to know what viruses are RNA viruses and which are DNA viruses? Yes. No, you do not need to know that. Great questions. I like the questions. You, you guys have been thinking about this. That's good. And I am not really um, going to be asking you um, anything with respect to, um, you know, what is the shape of a given type of virus. Um, if I specifically talk about, say, naked viruses and, and the tobacco mosaic virus being one example of that, that causes the yellowing and, and, and um, discoloration of leaves, Often, you know, leaves in your garden, tomato plants, or um, well, any vegetable. If, if you ever have a garden, you kind of know what I'm talking about. Sometimes plants can show stress, um, whether it's not enough water or too much water. But oftentimes, there are certain types of viral diseases that can uh, impact the growth of the plant. It, it, it basically doesn't allow photosynthesis to occur properly, and plants need to do that to grow more fruit. Um, um, when I specifically maybe mention like tobacco, tobacco mosaic virus and connect that with it being a negative or with connect it with being a, a naked virus, then, then I think you should know that that particular virus. If I talk about COVID-19 being an enveloped virus, then I think you should know that. If I talk about, um, 
the T2 bacteriophage as being a unique complex virus, I think you should know that. But I'm not going to ask you, you know, is the herpes simplex virus a helical nucleocapsid or does it have an icosahedral nucleocapsid? I'm not going to get that specific. Um, so I don't want you to get all caught up in uh, knowing exactly what kind of a virus the mumps virus is or polio virus is, papilloma virus is. We, we talk about these different viruses in, in the lecture, some of them anyway. Um, I think as a healthcare professional, what you're gonna need to know if anything down the road with respect to viruses or bacteria or even this class in general, is not only an appreciation of how microbiology fits into you know, our health. But if you ever had a question about a particular virus and you wanted to learn more about what it was or what it causes, you would at least have some semblance of what it is, what this virus is. And you, could, you would know to go to your book or some other you know, periodical that you have at the hospital or online or whatever, and you'd at least be a little more knowledgeable. Right, that's the whole idea here. You can't, you can't know all this stuff or, or remember it, it's just not possible. If you were a virologist and it was your, your life, then sure. But you know, when you guys become nurses or occupational therapists or physical therapists, you're gonna know a lot about that field. You're gonna know a heck of a lot. Anything else in the virus chapter that's causing you any, any problems? I have a question. Okay. Um, referring to, lice, how, do you, how do you say it? Lysogeny. Is that just the bacteria faucet or is that the animal viruses too? Okay, that's a great question. Um, my understanding, Monica, of this, and, and, I, and I, I'm only basing it on what I know, is that this process occurs, um, I've only seen it um, discussed with regard to bacteriophage biology. Um, but but I, I would just, I would be careful um, in saying it's exclusive to bacteriophages. That's all I've ever learned it connected with. But if I did some additional research, if I type on in Google, um, you know, uh, lysogenic state of microorganism, um, it, it could potentially take me to some sites where they talk about how other virus DNA maybe gets incorporated into cells. I, but as far as I know, and all you need to worry about is that this lysogenic cycle that I'm happy to talk about if you have more questions, um, relates solely to bacterial genomes being impacted by that. It's a really good question. Does everybody know what Monica's asking? The lysogenic state? called? Is that where the virus just kind of hides out in the bacterial nucleic acid until the bacteria itself reproduces and then it's stimulated to grow itself? Is that what it, that one is? That's, that's, the, that's the gist of it, yes. Let me um, just go to that slide real quick. And this is a, a really uh, unique process. Um, you guys see that? No. Okay. So here we've got a bacterial cell 
with some bacteriophage or phage for short on the surface. So this is this is a back, this is a virus that attacks bacteria. It injects its DNA into the host cell. And then in the case of this lysogenic cycle or state, the viral nucleic acid, typically it's DNA, shown here in blue, okay? So just pretend that the blue bacteriophage is injecting blue DNA. And this chromosome here, I know it's kind of hard to see, but this would be red, solely red. The blue segment here of the viral DNA gets incorporated into the genome, into the chromosome of the bacterium. Now remember, bacteria only have one chromosome and it's in a loop. Okay, double-stranded loop. And so here is the what's called the prophage. This prophage DNA is viral DNA that has been incorporated into the genome of the bacterial chromosome. And that's really interesting because when that cell goes to divide, when that bacterial cell goes to divide, it's going to um, replicate its, its chromosome. Make another copy of it. And then the two daughter cells that result in a process called binary fission, okay, it's different than mitosis. We'll talk more about that later. But binary fission is the way that bacterial cells typically divide. The result is the formation of two daughter cells, both of which would have their own red colored DNA and the blue colored prophage, all in that one chromosome. So bacteria can pass on these, these traits, these, these genes that were introduced by virus. And what they've discovered is that sometimes bacterial cells can become more pathogenic by having that extra bit of instruction booklet, if you will, those extra few pages added to the book, right, coming from the virus. And those pages present the cell with the ability to maybe make a capsule, as, which we talked about in lab today, and we will this afternoon, as being a good thing, because then you're protected, more protected from the phagocytic action of white cells. Now, if you had not received the booklet, if you will, to make the capsule, you'd be more susceptible to being phagocytized and killed. Or maybe the cell can suddenly now make enzymes or certain types of toxins that make it more virulent. Now, that's not good for you and me, but if I'm a bacterial cell and I'm, I'm out there to cause infection, virulence is one thing I like to be, <laughs> you know, in a weird kind of way. And that virulence would not have occurred if it had not received the viral instruction booklet in the form of the viral DNA. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. And if enough of those cells divide, pretty soon now you have an army of cells, if you will, that have undergone this lysogenic conversion. And now we're dealing with a much more uh, um, uh, pathogenic form of the bacteria. That's what this slide gets at. Now, again, this process does not result in the host cell making more viral particles. Okay, that's called the lytic cycle. That's, that's this. Okay, that's the right half, if you will, of that figure. Um, but the point, a point in time will come in this, in this uh, cell, let's say that's undergone lysogenic conversion, okay? There'll come a point in time where it could be triggered into entering the lytic cycle. And I've, see, I've dissected that, that slide here. Uh, so you don't see both side by side, but look on page 182, you'll see what I'm talking about. Here's an, here's an arrow right here, see it? That says, 
I can go from the lysogenic state into the lytic cycle and, and the result being the immersion of more bacterial phage, right, that the cell ends up making. And if you think about it, um, and we'll talk more about this down the road because I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. These resulting bacteriophages that leave, what are they carrying inside of them primarily? These, these guys that are leaving the cell, what are they carrying? Nucleic acid. Yeah, and what's that nucleic acid coming from? It's coming from the cell, but what is it? Is it, is it viral nucleic acid? Is it bacterial nucleic acid? Is it a combination of both? What do you think? Viral? Some of them is gonna, some of it's gonna be viral. But if this cell was harboring the prophage. Oh, it's gonna be both. If this is harboring the prophage, meaning part viral, mostly bacterial, and you replicate that, if it's a DNA virus, it's possible, is it not? that some of these phages could be carrying some bacterial genes? Yeah, yeah. Again, we're getting ahead of ourselves. We'll talk about that process coming up in another chapter, but at least you, you can kind of see where that could happen, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. So this, this opens up your mind to lots of things that you probably never ever thought much about in terms of how genes can be passed on from virus to bacteria to virus from bacteria to virus to bacteria. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Other questions? Anything you want to talk about as far as lab goes? Although this is not really lab, but. Is a bacteriophage just a name for a virus that only affects bacteria? Yeah. Bacteriophages will not will not affect um, eukaryotic cells. They only affect prokaryotic cells. Now, archaea, right? That domain archaea. Um, I have not studied this at all, so I'm not even sure what I'm talking about. But I would not be surprised if there are not viruses that also infect our kins. I've never studied it. I've never read about it. I've never researched it. But um, but that would be interesting to learn about. We focus mostly on bacteriophages as just an introduction to this group of viruses that target bacteria. You, you do understand we're just scratching the surface of so much of this stuff. We could delve into a lot of any of this if, if, if you wanted to, if you were you know going on to grad school or whatever and learning about viruses or epidemiology or what have you. I have a question, another one. Yeah. <laughs> Referring to the chronic latent state stuff. So does that mean that I myself, I had chicken pox, so I can get shingles. If you, my, my kids, for example, they've been vaccinated against chicken pox. Does that mean they can never get shingles because it wouldn't be able to be latent? You know what no. I'm trying to say? Yeah, I understand your question. So what Monica is asking, and let me just kind of go to that slide that I think just kind of mentions it, doesn't get into much detail. Um, oh, where did I talk about that? So Monica is asking about certain kinds of um, viruses, and, and you mentioned the, the pox virus, virus, which is a, a good one to use. We have, most all of us 
have come down with chicken pox as kids. Right? Yeah, I've never had it, Tiffany. I see you looking. I don't know if you're looking at me. I've never had it. Okay. You haven't never had it. That's interesting. And, and, and maybe it's because, uh, well, I think, well, I don't know. I don't know it's, if it's more common for people not to have it today than it was 30, 40, 50 years ago, like when I was a kid. I, I just kind of always had the assumption that when I was growing up, most everybody got it at some point in time. Maybe that's changed since then. Um, but some of these viruses, like the pox virus, in some people can sit dormant or latent in in tissues. And in the case of the pox viruses, like chicken pox, as I mentioned here, it's interesting that these viruses go into this resting latency stage in our nerve cells. Isn't that crazy? And they can sit there. We don't even know we have it. They don't cause us constant, uh, you know, chicken pox symptoms with respect to, you know, rashes on the skin, which is what we think of when we think of a kid having chicken pox or whatever. In, in the adult, this is just the adult version basically of, of the chicken pox, which can be a lot worse in terms of the effects from what I've heard. I've not had shingles, but I don't wanna have them because I have heard nothing but horror stories. Anybody wanna share any thoughts about shingles? Anybody have any stories to tell about relatives who've had shingles or? I My ex shingles. Go ahead. My ex-husband's aunt had shingles. And she had it on her forehead. And last I knew, it's been years since she had it. She still experiences pain from them. Okay, thank you. Somebody else? I had shingles actually two months before the semester started. And it was super painful. <laughs> It was painful. Yes. Um, yeah. So um, I've also heard of some people who said, I had a mild form of chicken pox. And then later in life, I got shingles. So I'm not sure, Monica, you know, what the connection would be. Is there any correlation between, between A, having been exposed to the pox virus as a kid, but not having chicken pox. But then later in life, it rears its ugly head, having been latent for 30 years. Or I've also heard these anecdotal stories of people who've had mild cases of chicken pox, but then a reoccurrence of bad shingles as adults. I think the vast majority of people have had chicken pox as kids, had it pretty, I won't say bad, but had a good, a good infection, if you will, uh, and then never have had a problem with it ever again. So what makes a person, A, um, harbor the virus only to reoccur in a bad case of shingles versus somebody who, who uh, doesn't? I, I, I just don't know if there's any sort of environmental trigger or if it's an, if it's an immune thing. Um, Again, I, I assume the answers are maybe out there. I just have not researched it. I, I don't know. Um, or how many of us as kids or young adults have had chicken pox and have in our nerve cells some latent pox virus sitting there and maybe will be there for our entire lives and never cause a problem. I just don't know. I, I haven't done enough research to check it out and know the numbers. I find it fascinating just thinking about how it can be latent for that long in somebody's body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is interesting. As I said, we're just kind of like scratching the surface. We could spend an entire lecture talking about probably, you know, in what form does it sit? What nerve cells are we talking about? Is it in the brain? Is it in peripheral nerves? You know, is it in the spinal cord? How did, how did they get out? I mean, there's all sorts of really cool questions to ask. Um, what predisposes a person to get it? Is it, is it stress? Is it, an, is it a 
physi physiological trigger, um, you know, all sorts of questions. I work in a doctor's office um, and we tend to see that usually people that are going to get an outbreak of it or a reoccurrence of it, um, it's usually a stress trigger or an immune system trigger that they came down sick with something else and then it pops out and makes them even more miserable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I always thought that there was some sort of a, of a, of a stressor, a psychological stress that, that could trigger that, which of course, when we talk about psychological stress, that can manifest and often does manifest itself in physical symptoms too that we may or may not be aware of, you know? Um, yeah. <laughs> the old story years ago was, you know, if the neighbor had chicken pox, you'd send your kids over to play with the neighbor, right? Yeah. I remember as a kid getting them. And the only reason I remember getting them was the calamine lotion my mom put on me and the smell of that. It was, you know, you know what calamine lotion is. It's not like a horrible smell, but it has a distinct odor. It's pink, right? And I remember her putting that on, on me. And I remember her sending me over to play with Georgie next door. So. <laughs> no, I don't know if she did that, but. Um, it's so common in kids and it's so easily transmitted. It, it's really easy to transmit. Any other comments, questions? Um, I have a quick one. Mm -hmm. So, in the voiceover the lecture, um, you mentioned about parvovirus. Um, how is it that, I guess it's a whole bunch of different chemical stuff, um, that dogs can get it but can't transfer it to us? Like, are our bodies specifically made to like break down the chemical substance around them or? Again, you'd have to do some research there on that. Um... It must have to do, I would think, with the specificity with regard to, you know, host cell um, receptors and, and viral um, chemistry. Um, I don't know enough about the parvovirus, to be honest with you, as to why that is the case. But you bring up a good point, and that is some diseases, and we, we'll just broaden the discussion, not ex including just viral diseases, but, but even bacterial and, and, and other diseases. Um, we often talk about species specific defense. And we alluded to this very briefly in AMP1. But each species of, of organism on earth, and let's pick animals as an example, but we could talk about plants or fungi or protozoa. We can talk about any group of, of, of eukaryotic cells. But we'll, we'll choose animals. We know there's different kinds of animals, right? There's, there's mammals, there's reptiles, there's amphibians, there's birds, right? And even within the mammal group of which we, we are members, right? As are our cats and our dogs and our horses and our pigs and our rabbits, we're all mammals. Um, certain viruses can, be, can, can kill in large numbers certain kinds of animals. Like there's a particular virus, for example, going around now, and I forget the name of it, that is doing a job on wild rabbits. And I forget the name of it, but I'm pretty sure it's a virus. And, and it goes in cycles. So it's wiping out lots of rabbits. You don't see many rabbits around, they're saying anyway, this year or next. And then that kind of, you know, it ends its run, if you will, and, and the population comes back up and then the virus reoccurs or comes back and we go through these cycles. The point I'm trying to make is that 
certain types of viruses may target certain animals, but not others. And I think that's often what it boils down to with re regard to parvovirus. Dogs are impacted, humans are not. Um, we, have a, we have a protective ability to fight off or to negate the action of parvo. We could be exposed to it, but um, they're just not, there is not that recognition in terms of cell membrane receptor docking the adsorptive process uh, of the virus. I think that's the easiest way to think of that. And, and that gets back to evolutionary processes that either predispose the animal or group of animals to those viruses or protected them. AIDS virus started in primates in, in Africa. In, in probably monkeys and chimps, apes. And the reason that it, that it leaped over to humans is because we share a very similar um, evolution and taxonomy with, with, with primates. We are in the same order, primates. So there's more likely that, that, that zoonotic transmission from one group to another, especially if you're closely related, then it, then it would be, let's say, from a giraffe to a human, because we're, we're, we're both mammals, but we're, we don't share quite the same genome that we might with a, an ape, let's say. So it, it gets to discussion of diseases, how diseases you know, are passed. Fascinating stuff. It's back to epidemiology. Now, Sarah says, humans are too cold for parvovirus. Um, yeah, if, if, we're, if what you're trying to say there, Sarah, and, and I don't know much about it, but different animals have different body temperatures. And just having a couple of degrees higher or lower may make, make the difference between a virus being able to affect a cell or the cell being able to regenerate the virus. All sorts of small little, what we might not think of as, as important could be critical as to how that virus works or how that cell responds to the virus. I don't know. But. Okay, well, listen, we have about 10 minutes left. I will stay in the Zoom room here um, until my lab begins in another 15 minutes or so. So um, definitely start reading chapter uh, seven. And um, so when we get together then next Tuesday, we can talk about that chapter. Um, and we'll, we'll go from there. Okay, have a great day. The quiz next week will be on all of six and part of seven, correct? Um, the quiz on the 11th, you're asking. Is that right? Yes. Um, let's see. Why don't we have that? We haven't talked about that. We, we certainly should have or could have a moment ago. Um, I don't want to make it over too much material. Why don't we have that be over? Um, oh, let's see. People will be in. By that time, we'll be in the chapter seven. So let's have that be over chapter seven. And I'll send an email out right now while I think of it just so that everybody knows. So thank you, Stephanie, for bringing that up. Thank you. I'm just, I was just curious because I've been really sick the last few days and uh, I'm a little behind, so. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I, I appreciate you asking. I, I probably should have uh, made note of that myself and I just didn't happen to think ahead. So thanks for that. Okay, thank you. Okay, you're welcome.